नमस्ते संगम टॉक्स व्यूअर्स दिस इज एपिसोड फाइव इन ल्यूमिनरीज ऑफ बंगाल सीरीज प्रेजेंटेड बाय संगम टॉक्स एंड बांग्ला आभार टुडे टॉपिक ऑफ दिस एपिसोड इज रेलेवेंस ऑफ रविंद्रनाथ ठाकुर आफ्टर सेवेंटी सिक्स ईयर्स ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंस we have two speakers today joining us who will talk about rabindranath tagore ji also known as rabindranath thakur thakur our speaker today is joydeep maharaj and priyadarshi datta ji first i would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speakers joydeep maharaj was born in lubeck germany in 1962 but he grew up in kolkata which is known as the cultural capital of india During his years in the university as a student of English literature, he developed a passion for theatre. He found a job in a bank and tried to settle down in a so-called normal family life. But fatigue had set in. Joyji, Joydeep ji owes his spiritual legacy to Swami Parmananda, the great mystic monk of Bengal, who was loved and revered by thousands of followers across the world. His untimely demise in 1999. at the age of 45 left a void and joydeep ji gradually transformed from being a seeker and writer to a spiritual teacher today at 61 joydeep maharaj is a popular motivator feared by religious establishments but loved and respected by the youths for his openness vivacity and dynamism namaste joydeep ji welcome again to today's talk our another our other speaker today is mr priyadarshi datta priyadarshi datta ji born in 1974 is a writer columnist and independent researcher based in the new delhi he is the author of the book the microphone man how orators created a modern india it was published in 2019 it is the only work dealing with genesis and development of public speaking in india He is a columnist with news portals like News 18 and First Post. He was a regular writer for the Pioneer between 2001 and 2021. He also writes poems, short stories in Bengali as well as in Hindi. Welcome again, Mr. Dashi sir. Welcome. Our moderator today for this talk is Hemanti Banerjee ji. Namaste, Hemanti Banerjee. Welcome to the Sangam Talks. Himanti Banerjee ji hails from Dhanbad, Jharkhand, and currently lives in Boston, USA. She is the current president of Bangla Abar. Himanti ji is a healthcare technology expert, currently working for Boston Children's Hospital. He is a director of Boston Center of Excellence of Health and Human Development. She is also a certified yoga teacher who has taught in the Boston area for the past 25 years. She is a classical dance enthusiast, and she dances in Odissi style. She has a master's degree in physics from Banaras Hindu University, and a master's degree in computer science from Boston University. With that, I'll ask Manthi ji to take over and start this conversation for today. Namaskar. Thank you, Akshay, for the kind introduction, and um, welcome all our viewers um, to this session. On behalf of Bangla Abar, I welcome you to this episode of the Bengal Luminaries series. Many thanks to Sangam Talks for hosting this series. A little bit about Bangla Abar. Our NGO in the United States and Bharat, Bangla Abar means Bengal again. Our mission is to create awareness and educate the world about Bengal's culture, history, and heritage. We have been organizing many activities and events for the last three years, including celebrating the lives of forgotten freedom fighters. Durgotsab film festival etc now today's topic relevance of rabindranath after 76 years of independence popularly known as tagore is our dear rabindranath his family name was thakur which was anglicized as tagore Rabindranath as i know from my childhood 
as introduced by my father, was Robi Thakur as part of our family. Like Chanda Mama, Robi Thakur has been the growing up experience via his poems, dramas, songs, what not. Did I really understand his poems and songs when I was young? I must confess, no, not. As I grow older, only now I am beginning to fathom the Bisho Kobi, Kobi Guru Rabindranath. He was indeed a Renaissance thinker of his era, well, well ahead of his era. Today, we are going to present to you a few essential facets of this great man of India. On the other hand, Rabindranath read a vast proportion of native literature, including Vaishnav Padavali, Mangal Kabbo, Aul, Baul, and other types of Bengali lyrics. He was also attracted by Buddhist philosophy. Though he was grounded in Upanishadic philosophy, since his childhood association with Brahmo Samaj. On the other hand, he on the other hand, he had an in-depth reading of Herbert Spencer. J.J. Rousseau, Bertrand Russell, Kipling, and all other well-known philosophers, novelists, and educationists. The humanist, romantic, and aesthetic poet Rabindranath reached his highest level of ecstasy in spite of waves of personal losses and pain, which he accepted in everyday life. Some may find in him the grandeur of Western personalities, such as William Shakespeare, Alfred Tennyson, P.B. Shelley, Wordsworth, John Keats, and the great Kalidas of Bharat. Rabindranath is said to have born and bred up in an atmosphere of the confluence of three movements all of which were revolutionary. First, the movement to reorient and reposition Hindu Dharma and Hindu Samaj. Again, we must remember the great Rajasri Raja Ramohan Roy. That was the movement of Brahmo Samaj of which Rabindranath is a direct inheritor. The second was the change in the spirit and the form of literature after the initial contributions of Ramon Roy, who some regard as the father of Bengali prose. His earliest books on Bengali prose were Vedanto Grantho, Vedanto Sar, which were published in 1815 and 1816, respectively. Goryo Vyakaran is the first complete Bangla grammar written in Bengali. It was authored by Raja Ram Mohan Roy and published by the Calcutta School Book Society in 1833. We had a couple of sessions um, with us, like, you know, uh, we had in the um, past few weeks on Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Brahmo Samaj. Viewers, if you are interested, please go back and check it um, in YouTube. First complete Bangla grammar as it was written by a Bengali and was authored by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Then came Rishi and Sahitya Samrad Bunkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, who was said to have freed the Bengali language and literature from a rhetoric rigid as death and the lift the dead weight of ponderous forms from our language. The third revolution, revolution was the rising political consciousness of India and the revolt against foreign rule and oppression. Whether it was the Hindu Mela or later Anushinal Samiti and Jugantar revolutionary groups. Though they affected 
the whole of India, the all three movements had their origin in Bengal. And in all three, the members of the Thakur family took an active part. It is natural, therefore, that young Rabindranath's outlook on life and literature profoundly influenced that period as a lover of freedom in social, religious, political, and literary spheres. We have two eminent speakers, Sri Joydev Maharaj. Um, he will be speaking on different aspects of Rabindranath. Uh, over to you, Maharaj. Thank you, Hoimanti ji. Namaskar, Hoimanti ji and Priyadarshi ji, the eminent speakers, and also to all the members of the audience who are present. And uh, Hoimanti ji have given a very wonderful introduction of Rabindranath Thakur. It is a challenge for us Bengalis to try and present uh, Rabindranath Thakur to people who do not speak Bengali both in India and abroad. People know him as the one who had won the Nobel Prize and who had written the national anthem and he had a long beard. Except for that, there is not much that people know about him. And I cannot really blame them because uh, I remember when I was in class 9, we had a teacher and his name was Dominic Gomes. He was our English teacher. He used to make us read parts of the Gitanjali in English because it was part of our syllabus. And while we read these parts, he used to recite from memory the original Bengali Gitanjali just to demonstrate to us how poor the translations were. So sometimes we used to laugh together with our teacher when we used to compare the original with the translations. And we cannot blame uh, Rabindranath Thakur for that because where would he find in those days someone who knew Bangla and English like mother tongues and also someone who was a poet both in Bengali and English. Only that someone can probably do some kind of faint justice to Rabindranath's language and literature, which for me I think is untranslatable in any European language. You take, for example, the famous Bengali line, Chitto jeta bhoi shunno, uccho jeta shir. Even for non-Bengali audience, you will recognize some words and you will, you will see, you will feel the resonance of this pronouncement. You can say an utterance. Chitto jeta bhoi shunno, uccho jeta shir. In translation, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. It's nice, but it's like a sermon. It's, it's really like a sermon if you compare to the Bengali one, which is sheer and pure poetry, almost like a Sanskrit mantra. You see, that is the problem that uh, we suffered. And that is a problem, I think, why the West and everybody seem to lost get lost interest in Rabindranath Thakur because of this problem with translation. You take, for example, some simple song like Tumi Kamun Kore Gaan Karo He Guni, Ami Abak Hoi Shuni, Kebul Shuni. Now, nowadays, if, if we try to sort of, uh, in, a, in a poor way, if we try to translate, how do you sing, uh, dear maestro? I... I just listen, mesmerize, something like that. But if you see the original translation in Gitanjali, it's, it's a, I know not how thou singest, my master. I ever listen in silent amazement. Okay, people will get some information of what the, the poem is all about, but the beauty, the nuances, the, the direct you know, communication with the singer, the, the, the appeal, the traction of the verse, the words, the play, that is completely lost. Or example, or, or take for that, Amare tumi oshim korecho, amuni lila tabo. And that was translated to, Thou hast made me endless, such is thy pleasure. 
But nowadays, we won't uh, translate Leela as pleasure. Leela can, can say the divine play. So all these, uh, you know, problems uh, with the translations, that really was a big problem for non-Bengalis to understand or appreciate the essence of Rabindranath. And that is a great problem, I think, for us to convey. As you have just said, that you grew up with Rabindranath Thakur. I think we all did for generations. We grew up feeling, we, are, we grew up responding to nature, we grew up loving, we grew up with pain, with suffering, with sadness, and everywhere Rabindranath was with us. Everywhere. And it is very difficult to convey this through his songs, through his poems, through his wit, even his, his prose, his stories, his, his works for children, the wonderful uh, poems that are actually stories. A few days ago, I was talking with some of my friends about how we have lost the tradition of telling stories through poems and songs. You see, Ramayan, Mahabharata, and all these, uh, the, all the, the folk culture is full of this stories of gods and goddesses, of kings, of stories of ordinary people, all told in verses, all told in songs. And Ravindana Thakur tried to do that many times. He, he, he created musicals and he wrote many poems, wonderful poems, brilliant poems, stories, stories about from the Ramayana Mahabharata. Stories from historical events, stories from day-to-day -day life, stories about a servant, to stories about a, a man who lost his land to the zamindar, and all these things, the whole gamut of life. He used to tell a lot of stories in poems. So, Rabindranath Thakur was, he, he wrote, let's say, more than 2,300 songs, more than 2,000 poems, more than 100 short stories. And some of these short stories are brilliant. And he was one of the pioneers of story writing, short story writing. I would, I could, I, I just invite some of our readers, some of our audience to at least read some of these stories of Rabindranath Thakur. Now, nowadays, over the last couple of decades, good translations are being available in, uh, Penguin is publishing some good pub translations of Rabindranath Thakur's stories. He was a great story writer, a great playwright, a great uh, essayist, a commentator, uh, a br brilliant letter writer. So he was all these things rolled into one. As you have said, he was a renaissance. I mean, that period we do point out is a period of Bengali renaissance, but he was almost a single handed renaissance man. <laughs> as far as literature and creativity is concerned. Plus, he was the director of plays. He was an actor himself. He was a dancer. He was the creator of Vishwabharati. He was a zamindar who had a large estate to look after, and he did that very meticulously. So that is one point that I wanted to emphasize on, the difficulty of conveying not only the greatness of Rabindranath, not only the genius of Rabindranath, but the impact, the influence that he has on us, not only had, still has on us, it's very difficult to convey that. Some of his songs, which he himself claimed would live forever, maybe not his other uh, uh, things, his, his, his novels and his poems may die out. And these songs, nowadays, most of my friends who sing, who are singers, they say they consider Raminda Sangeet to be modern Bengali songs. They are so timeless. They are so relevant. They touch every aspect of our life. As I was saying, our sense of beauty, love, pain, separation. And from that, I come to the next point that, uh, as you had just mentioned about his personal losses, about his tragedies in life, we call him a Rishi poet. Now, what's significant? about being a Rishi. And why do we say that he's a Rishi poet? Remember that the great Ramayana was composed by a Rishi, not just a poet. The great Mahabharata was composed by a Rishi. So all the great knowledge that has come down to us from ancient times 
have been utterances of rishis. <clears throat> and Rabindranath Thakur was a rishi in the sense that he was passive, he was detached. Whatever he was talking about, he never really got terribly involved in these things so that he could observe life from a distance, enjoy, and at the same time, see all the sides of the story. If you, if you are agenda driven, if you are politically driven, if you are ideologically driven, the quality of your output suffers. And Rabindranath Thakur was never that. He was never driven by ideology, by a particular ideology that he had to convey. He was never driven by any political opinions when he was creating. And he was never driven by any bias of any kind. So that when he described life, life that was happening also inside himself, his sadness, his sorrow, his losses, his pain, he was somehow detached. A part of him was detached from this so that he could really see the message. He really could see the unity in everything. And all his output, whatever he wrote, somehow were an address to the divinity. Somehow they were like a prayer to the divinity. He used to say among, uh, among friends that his songs are divided into sections, puja, praying, the seasons. He had many songs for each season. For example, spring, summer, autumn, monsoon, winter. And puja and prem especially, we used to tell that somehow they become indis indistinguishable from each other. When that puja becomes prem and when that prem becomes puja, love, worship, devotion, they all roll into one. This kind of theme was always there in Rabindranath Thakur. All his works from the beginning to the end is like a huge epic, one wholesome experience. It's like a, new, it's like a journey and a very positive journey towards fulfillment, towards divinity, towards truth, towards beauty, towards harmony. That was it, that I think from personally, Others may have their own opinions. Readers will obviously interpret in their own way. But that to me is the hallmark, the greatness of Rabindranath Thakur. It's very difficult to pick up individual works and say, here it is different. Here he's done this. He has. In fact, he was, another thing about Rabindranath Thakur was that he constantly learned. He constantly evolved. So much so. And it's... Uh, towering presence was so all-encompassing that even during his time, there was this Kallol Goshti, as you know, the, the, the young group of poets who were trying to work, do something different for Rabindranath Thakur in the 60s and the 70s. Some of the poets used to complain that when we try to talk about love or when we try to talk about life, we have nothing to say because he had said everything. <laughs> yes, just put everything into words, put everything, every, every sensitivity of ours, every feelings of ours. And uh, it's very difficult. So that is why one of the reasons, why Mintiji, I think that the next generation suddenly turned to atheism. You see, suddenly they were not believers anymore. Suddenly they were, uh, they tried to step out of the Indian ethos. And then, of course, came the communism and the Marxist influence or whatever. The hungry generation, the angry generation of poetry is very significant because Rabindranath Thakur, you will see, was never angry. <laughs> that is also one of the things that makes him a Rishi. In spite of all the criticisms, he used to make fun of himself. As you remember in Shesher Kobita, one of his uh, uh, last novels, in which he was making, as a, as a young modern poet, he was making fun of Rabindranath Thakur, of himself. So that is the greatness of this man. He never reacted. He responded and he evolved. He changed himself. For a first, when Shorachandra Chattabadha's first uh, story came out in a different name, Mezdidi, and people thought that this story is so brilliant. It must be written by Rabindranath Thakur. And they gave it to him. He read it and he said, 
such a great poet himself, he said, no, it is not written by me, but somebody has written it and he's a better storyteller than I am. He's a better writer than I am. You see, that is the greatness, the humility, the love for literature, the way he inspired the young generation. He took all these brickbacks, the, all these sufferings, personal losses, you know, and he somehow he tried to find a meaning in all this. And he did. He was a seeker. He was always a seeker, seeking the ultimate experiences of life and trying to take the, the Bengalis along with him. He himself had claimed in, in, uh, in Mangpute Rabindranath, there's a wonderful uh, book where we, we get Rabindranath Thakur in completely a different mood, where he's telling Maitre Devi that one day Bengalis will realize what I have done for the language, what I have done for the culture. Single handedly, he took Bengali from infancy to maturity. He took Bengali to a level which is, you know, incomparable. And, of, and at, the same, at the same stage as the world stage, we were mentioning about other poets. Look, our little experience of, uh, of our world literature has told me one thing, that if you, if you take his plays, yes, you can compare him with uh, Shakespeare, other, other playwrights. If you take his poems, yes, you can compare him with some others. You can take his stories, you can compare him with Chekhov and others. But as a whole, he's incomparable. His experience and his craft and his brilliance in every aspect of literature and other fields of art is just incomparable. And that is very difficult to convey to somebody else. I, the only thing I can say is that if you really want to enjoy, because Rabindranath Thakur is a, is a lifetime experience for somebody who gets into it. There, were, there was a time when he became famous. Students used to come from Japan, from Europe, from China just to stay in Shantiniketan, learn the Bengali language in order to read Rabindranath Thakur in original. You see? So that is the effort that they had put in because somehow they realized that what we are getting in English or in other languages is just 1% of what he is. So I would invite uh, uh, the non-Bengali speaking members of the audience to at least start reading some of his the English translations of his prose especially his short stories. And then if you really want to enjoy the songs and the poems and the greatness and the brilliance of Rabindranath Thakur, learn Bengali. <laughs> Otherwise, you will never get it. So that was my point, Amindiji. Now you can sort of take on from here. It was beautifully said, Maharaj. Um, his fastness, his personality as high as mountains. His thoughts are as deep as ocean. And still in everyone's, everyone's heart, like he touches everyone's heart. How is it possible? I always think about that. And the emotions, it resonates with our emotion. Our thoughts resonates with his thoughts. Like it is unbelievable. And um, what you have mentioned, Maharaj, that quite a few points which uh, beautifully said over here that he was very much detached what he used to do writing in terms of writing, in terms of songs, in terms of drama, everything, the creativity. He was attached that moment. He was doing that. As soon as it is done, he was detached from itself. And that actually gives a lot of divinity it actually has the divinity. That's why it has all the divinity in all of his poems, songs, and it's still alive. We are, we are singing. We are, when we are in pain, we sing his song. When we are joyful, who is, you know, that time we recite his poem. So it's so beautiful. Um, I would, again, um, 
please request you to go to your next session and elaborate the next session, the uh, next topic. Yeah. What you said about detachment reminds me of a, a conversation between Ravindana Thakur and Moitri Devi again. One day Moitri Devi said in, a, in her youthful and slightly, you can say, uh, hurt or manner that uh, you are with us, talking with us, joking with us, playing with us, loving us. But somehow when I see you alone, sitting at the window, looking out, you're not here. You're far away. Somehow you're here and you're not here. Somehow something there is that we can't really hold you. You are Somehow you are always elusive. And he smiled. And in a rare fit of, you can say, frankness, he said, you're right. I have been always like this. I have never really anchored my boat anywhere particular. Though I have got married, I have children, I have done a lot of work, worldly things. But somehow I have remained outside this. Otherwise, I would not have been able to achieve what I have done in my life. So that was a very touching moment in, in trying to understand. And also this is uh, somehow, Hemantiji, I feel for all those people who want to be writers and artists, this is a great learning experience for them also. Because this is also a guidance to how one should approach his art how one should approach life. He did not have a guru in the, in the you know, spiritual, traditional sense, but he watched his father uh, doing meditation every morning, and he used to do that throughout his life. Look at the rising sun and sit there for one hour, two hours, and that was all. And always he was in that mood, always an understated humor, sense of humor, this ability to laugh at everything, this ability to see the funny side of life in everything was so brilliant, especially you will notice that when he uh, wrote literature for children, it was so wonderful. Uh, his, his fun, his, 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 this fun loving the child that was in him. So yes, uh, my, my second uh, section, Mahamuntiji, is on something entirely different. So I would like uh, to, to hear a bit of what Priyadar Shiji has to say about Ravindana Thakur. We all wish to learn from him a lot. I, of... I, yeah, I want to just, um, I remember one story, actually. I just want to uh, share uh, with you that it was the month of August 1920, a letter came to Gurudev. Uh, when we are talking about his um, his poetry, his songs. Uh, the letter actually was written by uh, Susan Wen, uh, mother of Wilfred Wen, uh, the, the famous poet. And she wrote to Rabindranath Thakur that I lost my eldest son two years back in a war in France. We are extremely sad and in despair. I do not know whether this letter will reach to you or not, because I do not have your address. At this moment, I think your name is your address. My son, before he went to war, he used to be engrossed in your poems. He used to read the following lines again and again. When I go from hence, let this be my parting word, that what I have seen is unsurpassable. Please do let me know where do I get these beautiful poems of yours. That person was none other than, other than poet Wilfred Owen, died at the age of 25. And that was translated from Jabar Bala, a kothati bole jano jai, ja dekhechi, ja pechi, tulono tarnai. And it's from Gitanjali, 142nd poem, part of it. Uh, Priyodarshi, Mr. Priyodarshi, Dattu, please elaborate, or you, if you have to share anything here, please go ahead. Uh, please unmute yourself, uh, Priyodarshi ji, you are muted. 
Yes. I think you can listen to me now. Yes. Uh, No, again, again, we, we have we lost. We cannot you. listen. Yeah, we cannot right. listen. I think, can you listen to me now? Yeah. Yes, now yeah. we can, yes. I think, am I audible? Yes. yes. I think uh, I was hesitant to speak uh, when, I, uh, um, when I when I heard about this, when I was invited. Uh, because Rabindranath Tagore, I just wanted to know that what is the audience? Is the audience going to be Bengali or the audience is the, the national audience? Uh, which may not know Bengali, because Rabindranath Tagore was a Bengali poet, and uh, most of his poems and the songs, and the, there is a uh, the, there is a, a fraction of his writings are, are in original English, and other things are translated. But this is a problem with not just Tagore, but many other people who write songs and poems that they are not, cannot be rendered into a different language with the same kind of felicity as uh, um, prose can be translated. It is easier to read a novelist or to an essayist in a different language, and we all do that. But a poem, and in Tagore's poems, you know, most of the time, the, the, the rhythm, the rhythm and the melody counts as much, as much as the substance or the insight. So when we try to uh, translate it, the the rhythm and the melody uh, uh, is, is is no longer there to that extent. Uh, it has happened with most of the translations are there, including his own. But anyway, what I can say that Joydeep Maharaj has uh, lessened my burden by speaking on uh, this aspect of Tagore. And uh, but I am just going to relate here a very small, uh, very interesting anecdote, uh, which I feel that Tagore, despite the disadvantages that accompany trans, uh, translation has still reached out to a disproportionate number of people. At least people know him and people hold him in high esteem, although they may not know about the details of his writing. Uh, for example, when Tagore passed away, the Bishal Bharat uh, Patrika, which was the Hindi, uh, one of the Hindi uh, magazines which was to be, which was published. Uh, by Ramanando Chatterjee, who was to also bring out the modern review uh, in uh, 1941 um, December or somewhere, they brought out a special um, uh, special uh, uh, issue on Tagore. And in that issue, which I have with me in a digital format, I find that many of the interest, uh, many of the known uh, uh, Hindi literature uh, have written in that. Also, in Tagore, though being writing in Bengali, it is true, but his Bishop Bharati was able to attract talents from many places. People as different as Jawaharlal Nehru and Balraj uh, Sani would be, you know, would go there, and Balraj Sani was associated with the teacher. And then uh, Rabindranath Tagore, he was also, he did something like very few people know he was the first person to introduce judo into India by inviting uh, a judo expert, a judoka from the Japan. Uh, he was uh, involved in so many things that it, the Tagore is like a banyan tree. So the people who even do not know Bengali, I'm surprised to find uh, uh, still them, they have read uh, some of the Tagore's work and have a very high opinion about him. But as uh, I shall speak later on, probably, but there are some misgivings about the uh, Tagore's have come up and there are some doubts on him, which we'll try to clear in this. But uh, uh, there is an interesting anecdote which I wish to close my intervention here. Uh, it, it, was around the it was around the year uh, 1943. I think Tagore has passed away, but India has not been partitioned yet, although partition was very much in the air, 1943 or 44, sometime like this. A delegation from Iran had come, which was called Persia in those days, to Delhi. And there is an Iranian cultural center, which still stand there. Uh, uh, near, I think uh, this is near Heli Road. So uh, one of the uh, Iranian scholar, who also happened to be a minister or ex-minister, I have forgotten, 
so when they, they, they spoke a lot of them, somebody asked him that, who do you think is the most known poet of India in uh, Persia? So he said, undoubtedly, Rabindranath Tagore. So at this, uh, there was some uh, Muslim journalist, and Delhi, as you know, was the headquarter of uh, Muslim League at that time, and Muslim League was quite powerful at that time. It was, you know, just a few years before the party. They took an umbrage and said, "How it is not Iqbal because Iqbal has written original works in Persian, original works in Farsi. So how come?" Tagore, by writing something uh, in Bengali, could be rated about Iqbal in Persia. This story is related. Actually, this story is related in a biography of Iqbal written by uh, Sachidananda Sena, who also was the uh, uh, the interim speaker of the Constituent Assembly before Dr. Rajendra Prasad became its president. He was the interim president, uh, Sachidananda Sinha, you know, a great politician and also a, a maker of modern Bihar. He is also said like that. So he, he says it uh, in, a, in a biography of Iqbal. So the, they all walked out. The, 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 the pro-Muslim League uh, journalists walked out and they say we are going to protest against it to the government of uh, Persia. And uh, Mus initially, Muslim li and the Muslim uh, Aligarh Muslim University also showed some interest into this. But ultimately, when it came to sending a signed letter to the government of Persia, many most of them backed out. And so ultimately, nothing came about to it. The Iranian uh, ambas uh, the Iranian minister who had said that maybe Iqbal writes in uh, 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 Persian. We don't deny that. Maybe he is known to he is. Uh, uh, favorite of some people in Persia, but Tagore had come to Persia, and as far as the Indian poet is concerned, India is known through Tagore. That is a settled fact, and uh, he, people know how. Do you understand Bengali? He said, "No, we understand him through translation. English translations are available." So I said, although uh, a translation may not be a very good uh, understanding, you know, my, my teacher used to say that if you want to translate from Bengali. This is laughable. But still, uh, but still, it seems to have been bridged. And Tagore, uh, I have uh, found uh, many people who are uh, into literature, uh, do, uh, have, read, uh, have, have read Tagore through the translation. But as it happens in a in, in a present day, uh, you know uh, we have lesser amount of time, and probably that less that Tagore was, after all, a creative persona. We cannot just bound him through some ideology and uh, through his uh, opinions on certain issues. Uh, Tagore was, after all, a creative person, and a creative person thinks come from within. Uh, <laughs> so he may not conform <laughs> to what we think about him. So that is what I find, but still uh, through translation, I think Tagore has still reached the world over. And many people, as uh, Mohamontidi said about Wilfred Owen, there are others like W.B. Eats and uh, uh, Eats and <coughs> others uh, who have you know, loved Tagore. So this is what for the time being. Hoimanti ji, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Hoimanti ji, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're no, still again. not on. Uh, uh, okay, okay, no. No, Hoimanti, I'm talking about Hoimanti ji. You are still not yes. audible. Yes, now it's okay. Okay, great. Uh, it's about what I can say that it's about the magic of Ravindranath Chakur. Uh, even though uh, Maharaj uh, mentioned, uh, Mr. Dotto, you mentioned that a lot of um, the essence get lost in translation um, in many, many languages. His, uh, his poetry, his poems, his novels, 
has been translated to many, many languages, but still we get the essence. And people are from different parts of the world. They know India through uh, Thakur. So I'll um, request Maharaj to go to your next topic and enlighten our views, viewers. Thank you, Aminti ji. And uh, uh, Pyodashi ji's uh, little speech has evoked a lot of wonderful thoughts in me. One of them being is uh, slightly sad, slightly funny about when Rabindranath Thakur tried to bring in a Japanese master to teach martial arts, especially to the girls. And uh, he had to uh, convince these girls uh, of, of Vishwabharati to participate in these martial arts uh, sessions. But when finally, when the teacher came, I think his name was Okakura. I think you will correct me if I'm wrong. So he came, but all these girls remained inside. They refused to come out. And so Okakura had to really feel quite embarrassed in front of this teacher. The next day, he called all these girls who were supposed to take the class. And instead of being angry with them, he wrote a song for them. The song being, Sankochero Bihulata. Nijero Apoman, that when you uh, when you inhibit yourself, you insult yourself, you know. And he made them, all these girls, learn and sing that song. So that was they, they, this is Rabindranath Thakur. This is the way he responded, without harshly, without harshly treating them, without scolding them, without getting very upset. He made them sing this song. So somehow as this song becomes a mirror in front of them, because he really meant well. He, he really wanted the girls to be able to defend themselves in times of crisis. My second uh, a section, Harimantiji, as, as you have said, is about this concept of nationalism, which is a, a heated thing. <laughs> At that time, even today, Rabindranath Thakur is being portrayed as someone who was uh, not nationalist enough. Well, my first point, very vehemently, I would like to say, he was not a secular in the sense that we know today. Today, we know what seculars are. It's secular means you bash Hindus and you shed crocodile tears for the minority community. That is called secularism in today's uh, context. He was not at all a secular in that sense. And I would like to say that he was a very, very vocal Hindu. Uh, and quite proud of his Hindu identity, quite concerned about the Hindu population of India. And he had, he had many times expressed in various letters, in various interviews about his concerns. And he was very critical about the Islam ideology and the attitude of the Muslims in India. This, this point has to be noted. Before that, I would like to meet, uh, quote from Ramesh Chandra Mojumdar, his history of Bengal. He had written, Hindu national sentiments had built nests in the minds of many Hindu writers, though they would never consciously acknowledge it. Important. The best example is India's Rabindranath Thakur, whose famed international humanism cannot be reconciled with his communal views. But the truth is, Many of his poems and adulations or tributes, many of his poems are adulations or tributes to the valor and courage of only Sikh, Rajput, and Marathi warriors. He had not written a single line glorifying Muslim brave hearts, though there were many in India. Asi Mojundar is saying this with a little bit of sadness, I think. From this, we can imagine the roots of the nationalistic sentiments in the 19th century Bengal. This is Ramesh Chandra Mojumdar. The, so this is not only true for Rabindranath Thakur, but also some others who tried to hide this bias. You see, somehow they had to, even like today, they had to act more progressive. They had to act like they are more, uh, they, they feel brotherhood for each other, etc., etc. Another thing that we mistake about Rabindranath Thakur that he was very, in a sense, opposed to the ideology of Shakta. You see, opposed to the ideology of Kali or, the, or 
worshipping uh, India or Bharat as Bharat Mata, which is not true. He was a great uh, admirer of uh, Bankimdhanda Chattabhadda's Anandamot and Bande Mataram. He, he set music to Bande Mataram. In fact, people, while we always mention about his songs, we forget to mention what a great composer he was. Another thing about Rabindranath Thakur that we must remember that about, of all his senses, he himself admitted, probably my ears are the best. Because whatever he heard, he remembered. Even when he goes to Scotland or to Europe and he's, he listens to some folk music there, somehow it, re, it, it, remain, it remains somewhere inside. And many years later, the touch of that music comes out in some song that he composes. So he always said that the only thing that I want from God is take away all my senses in my old age, keep my ears alive. That is something that he suffered from. He, he, <laughs> he became hard of hearing <laughs> towards the later stages of his life. Anyway, so there is one poem which I would like to uh, first a uh, little bit of. That's just four lines in Bengali. He's invoking his country, Bharat Mata. Dan hate tor khargo jale, bahat kore shanka haron, dui na hoin dui na yone sneher hashi, lalat netro agun baron ogoma. He is invoking Bharat Mata in these words, which are very unlike Rabindranath Thakur or the idea of Rabindranath Thakur that people have, which very roughly, my, my very poor translation, it would be something like, in your right hand burns the falchion, the left hand robs our fears, the two eyes are filled with your affectionate smile, the third eye is the color of fire. Another, another little example, this in a letter to Amir Chakravarti, 1934, uh, two Bangla lines, which I'm not quoting in original, I'm just giving in the English version. Today they are pampering the Muslims. He's talking about the Indian National Congress. Today they are pampering the Muslims. The same Muslims will one day hold the mallet. Mushal Prashab Korbe will hold the mallet. In an interview to Anandabajar Patrika, 5th September 1923, he said, 40 lakh Hindus are scared to death of 1 lakh Muslims. Rabindranath Thakur is saying that. So much for your anti-national and secular. Then this another very interesting point. On the land of Bengal, the story of Ramayan has not been able to raise its head over the stories of Hargori and Radha Krishna. And that is indeed unfortunate. Those who have accepted Ram as an ideal on the battlefield and their social activities have courage, valor, a sense of duty and moral obligations which make them far superior to us. This is a quotation from Lok Shahitya, where he tries to say that we are so steeped in this Vaishnav traditions of Radha, Krishna, Kirtan and uh, amorous relationships, this and that, the sweetness, the memories, etc. We forget the, the valor, the sense of duty, the vision of Ram, the, 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 the first person who tried to, to sew the whole Arjavata together through relationships, through friendship, through love, and also through conquest without occupying. For example, he conquered Sri Lanka, but did not occupy Sri Lanka. You know, these things have to be learned from him. So this is what he said that somehow the Bengalis are still, you know, enamored by these stories of Radha Krishna and yet they are not being inspired by these great courageous icons of our, of our, uh, of our epics. Another, in another place, he, uh, this is a speech that he had given. In a, in a press meet in Times of India newspaper, a very important issue has made Hindu-Muslim unity virtually impossible, which is Muslims do not have loyalty to any particular country. Even a leader like Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali was one of the founders of the Khilafat movement, even a leader like Muhammad Ali has announced that under no circumstances will Muslims fight against Muslims to protect a country. There are numerous other instances of these such comments from Rabindranath Chakur. And uh, 
people are somehow even admirers of Rabindranath Thakur will be shocked by these statements because we are so used to this soft secularism idea and most of the people of secular people of Bengal so called secular are great admirers of Rabindranath Thakur they find in Rabindranath somebody who is their icon in as far as secularism is concerned what what is different as Prerya Shiji has rightly said that we cannot really judge Rabindranath Thakur, his political thoughts, his national nationalistic thoughts or whatever by today's standards is he was not similarly critical of the Europeans. You see? So he was not at all, you can say, very sympathetic towards the extreme nationalistic elements in the Congress party. Because he felt that they were imitating the European model of nationalism, which is which goes against the Indian or the Bharatiya ethos. This is very important because he said that if the European model of nationalism is a yardstick, then what do you do? You, you go to other places and plunder countries and you, kill, you destroy indigenous societies. You make them lose their memories. That is what you do. That is nationalism for them. That is the idea of the European nation state. This is not Bharat. This is not India. So he wanted freedom. He was a deeply patriotic person. He was very much a concerned Hindu, but he was not nationalistic in the sense of a jingoistic nationalism. You see, at least towards the first part of his you know, career, you can say uh, for first part of his journey, let's say. He, what he condemned was the, you know, the narrow and the exclusionary model of uh, nationalism that was adopted by the Europe, which has resulted in war, imperialism, and subjection of human beings. He was deadly against that. So such a model of nationalism, according to him, could not fulfill the moral, spiritual, and ethical needs of humanity. Now, you may agree or we may disagree with that point of view. But this was his point at that time. And his quote, his direct quote from Sadhana. So I repeat, we never can have a true view of man unless we have a love for him. We, if you think, okay, we understand Europe now. Through hatred? That is, that is his question. Through animosity? You know, through mistrust? Through suspicion? Is that the way you know a culture? So, so I repeat, so again he says, so I repeat, we never can have a true view of man unless we have a love for him. Civilization must be judged and prized, not by the amount of power it has developed, but by how much it has evolved and given expression to, by its laws and institutions, the love of humanity. So this is Rabindranath Thakur, very idealistic. You can say he was always like a, for him the world had to be a perfect world. Maybe today, in today's context, we understand the, that the militancy of Hindu nationalism is probably required to counter the militancy of other uh, forces. You see, we realize that. But in hindsight, after a lot of experience. And another thing about Rabindranath Thakur, and that's the last point which I would like to end with. Shubhash Chandra Bosch, when he was very young, talented, well known by that time because of his uh, brilliant career. And uh, Dilip Kumar Rai, being uh, very close to Rabindranath Thakur and a great friend of Shubhash, had brought Shubhash to Rabindranath Thakur and just to do pranam and respects, etc. etc. And Rabindranath Thakur, in a faint, sarcastic tone, he told Shubhash, I hear, I hear that you are on in this uh, revolution path, nationalistic feelings. Why don't you become international? He said. Internationalism is better, isn't it? The nationalism. And young Shubhash has said, I think it is impossible to someone to be, be, become international without first becoming national. This is a, for, a, for a young Shubhash, this is a wonderful answer, a wonderful response. You see, this same Rabindranath Thakur completely changed his views when the Second World War started. He realized, he began to realize what the Europeans were up to. He finally realized that, yes, we probably needed them in the sense that we had become a very close society. 
because of the foreign invasions and all these things. And these Europeans had come to open us up. Okay, for that purpose has been served. The Second World War proved that it is not anymore about civilizing the world. You know, this white man's burden is just garbage. He realized that. So it is rumored. Some of the Netaji scholars, they have told me this, that when he well, left Elgin Road, one of the first things he did was he went to Shantaniketan when Rabindranath was very old. He did pranam to him and Rabindranath blessed him with all his heart. And he also, as you, as you know, he also uh, sort of dedicated Tashed Desh, the, the, the house of cars, you can say, uh, to Shivashtrana Boshu, invoking him as the leader, as the hero that India needed. That, at that moment, he realized that, that, yes, the Europeans would have to leave India. Though he was never really a British hater in that sense. So that was my point. Uh, and I, we can come back, Amintiji, to you and to Priyada Shiji. Mr. Dattu, if you want to shed any light on this one after uh, Maharaj spoke. We, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Yes, yes. I think it's uh, Jadip Maharaj has spoken very eloquently and uh, all his points are well taken. I have nothing to add to this session. I really enjoyed it. That's great. I want to um, actually add to let add little bit to it what Maharaj said. I will just extend. Uh, it is from um, the crash of a civilization, uh, the book that Kanchan wrote. Um, as Mahesh, as Maharaj pointed out, that how he actually people actually comp compartmentalize him. He is a very good poet. He was, you know, a writer, a painter, everything, but not like nationalist in that way. Uh, he did not, they think like he did not talk about anything what happened, what Bharat went through. So that's the extension I'm just going to point out here. Rabindranath simply reminded the Hindus to shake off weakness, unite and fight for justice for all. Here is his appeal in very clear terms. And here is his warning for the Hindus. The terrible situation of the country makes my mind restless and I cannot keep silent. Meaningless ritual keep the Hindus divided in hundred sects. So we are suffering from series of defeats. We are tired and worn out by the fortunes, by the internal external enemies. The Muslims are united in religion and rituals. The Bengali Muslims, the South Indian Muslims, and even the Muslims outside India are all united. They always stand united in face of danger. The broken and divided Hindus will not be able to combat them. Days are coming when the Hindus will be again humiliated by the Muslims. You are a mother of children. One day you will die, passing the future of Hindus society, Hindu society on the weak shoulders of your children, but think, but think about their future. So this is what he said. And also he gave a clear indication about the solution path. That is also unbelievable. So that kingdom of idiocy, the fatal lack of common sense, was continuously invaded by the Pathans, sometimes by the Mughals, and sometimes by the British. From outside, we can only see the torture done by them, but they are only the tools of torture, not really the cause. The reason for the torture is our lack of common sense and our idiocy. 
I'm just comprehending this after 76 years of independence. Are we out of that? Are we still lacking the common sense? I think yes, which is responsible for our sufferings. So we have to fight this idiocy that divided the Hindus and imposed slavery on us. If we only think about the torture, we will not find any solution. But if we can get rid of our idiocy, the tyrant will surrender to us. And um, in an effort of national awakening of the Hindus, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, the great freedom leader, started Ganesh Utsav, as we know, and Shivaji Utsav, 1894, for um, national awakening. Many, many, many freedom fighters were inspired by this, um, especially by the ideals of Shivaji. And Ravindranath, his famous poem, Shivaji Utsav in Bangla, translation of a few most relevant stanzas are given, but I am just, um, you know, I'll be focusing only one stanza, which actually intrigues me. A few distant centuries ago, on a nondescript day, I can barely imagine upon what craggy hilltop within a dense sunless forest. O oh, sovereign Shibaji, lightning like across your forehead, they are flashed the thought from above with a singular religious thread, this torn up, fragmented Bharat, I shall bind in one. This is what Rabindranath was and he wrote. Um, we'll um, go to the next um, section of Maharaj. Yes, uh, thank you, Hermanti Ji, for the wonderful rejoinder. Yes, uh, in many of his poems, we find uh, this, uh, this is adulation of these great, brave, courageous heroes, Marathis and Rajputs. So, and even in, in, in one uh, poem, I remember he is invoking the Javans. He's asked, not really invoking, he's addressing the Javans. That means, in this case, the Europeans, and saying, look what Rajput women can do. They can all jump into the fire to save their honor, their dignity, and to save their race. Meaning, of course, that it is not only their personal honor that they are saving. It is also the, you know, the, the unwanted child that will be born uh, in their womb, from, from their womb. And the child will later become the enemy, enemy of her of his own country. You see, so Rabindranath uh, Thakur was very vocal about these things, and one must understand this. A question had come that uh, uh, this Shivaji Utshap, we have already mentioned that Rabindranath Ji, we don't have to repeat, and his take on Hindutva. As I said, if we if we think of today's India and today's ideas of Hindutva, we cannot sort of so look at Rabindranath from today's angles, as Priyadarshi Ji has also mentioned many times. But I think we have done enough to prove that he was a Hindu, very proud to be, and he detested that idea when somebody ever suggested that Brahmo Samaj was different from the Hindu Dharma. He, he wrote very, very clearly on the fact that you may say that Brahmo Samaj is different. I know that I am a Hindu. I'm a Hindu first, and the Brahma Samaj is just a one offshoot of our Hindu identity. So he was a very proud and a very conscious Hindu. And uh, maybe there are some contradictions in him, but that is that is because he's an artist, and that is why we love him. Well, who doesn't? We are not like some homogeneous kind of a pillar. Well, if, if at age, age 20, I, I believe in something, and even at age 70, I will still believe the same thing. Why? Why won't I change? Why won't I grow? Why won't I evolve? So he was an artist in many ways. He was a child. He enjoyed life. He, he trusted life. Sometimes his trust was broken, and he, so he did change opinions. You see? 
as i was saying he did not like kali at one time but then nivedita imagine a foreign lady nivedita came and for hours she used to sit with him and explain to him the concepts of kali and uh, rabindranath's response was very interesting he said i don't know how much i was convinced of kali but i saw the another man between the two of us <laughs> and that is vivekananda it is the first time i found that a, a young beautiful lady sitting in front of me and i am not the only man in in her life <laughs> there is another one between the two of us very interesting uh, observation uh, from ravindra thakur anyway yes uh, coming to the third section homindji ji my third section is the fact that you see he was a great karma yogi and why do i say that is because we always imagine ravindra thakur on the desk writing you see or sort of going to a reception or he is being felicitated in vishwa bharati or some other place or he is giving a speech in a in a congress uh, session you see but we don't realize how much of a hard worker he was he hardly wasted a single second of his life and how disciplined he was another very important thing where i think the next generation of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s poets somehow felt that becoming unruly taking drugs and drinking a lot of alcohol is like an artistic expression that is what what makes somebody an artist you see this is very i think very important to highlight this fact that rabindranath thakur was a very very hard worker and the whole the whole day used to be a sort of a clockwork of activities he was very disciplined he woke up with the sun he did his meditation he took long walks then he had this one big glass of neem then he sat down uh, on on the desk not every day he was writing poetry he was maybe he was checking proofs maybe he was correcting somebody's um, article maybe he was uh, he had written some uh, history uh, stuff himself and he was revising that he was constantly correcting revising changing and he uh, then he went out and he had this estate we imagine rabindranath thakur in this vajra in this special boat moving around and writing wonderful poems but he was also taking care of, of the huge estate under him you see among the 14 sons and daughters he was the only one on whom devendranath thakur entrusted uh, with the responsibility of the zamindari he had faith in him so darokana thakur who had who had uh, sort of put himself into great debt because of his extravaganza devendranath thakur managed to sort of somehow repay those debts and devendranath thakur managed to expand on that Ooh. while trying to be very honest and fair without being an oppressive zamindar that was one second how much work he put in for vishwavarati to collect the money to make that vishwavarati and to do everything so i think this is very important to understand that he not only was a great artist a brilliant craftsman a wonderful example but also at a personal level in his own lifestyle he is somebody we should learn to emulate because somehow with all the michael jacksons and all the great all the artists of the world somehow we associate them with a kind of a sexual orgies you see lot of drugs lot of indiscipline lot of you know bohemian attitudes you know even with our poets somehow that notion has become stereotyped you see we have to go back to the idea of a rishi poet who is whose sense of discipline is very impeccable and his commitment to his art commitment to his to his life to his sadhana to his saraswati is incomparable so that i think is very important to highlight that he was a great karma yogi even at the age of 79 80 when it was difficult for him to sit straight on the desk for a length of time even then he tried not to waste a single moment of his conscious life as 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 much as 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 he became conscious maybe from a stupor maybe from from a drowsiness because of old age he would sit up and try to write something or call someone dictate 
the next poem that he had in mind. You see, he was constantly, vigorously, uh, he, was, he, was, he was creating something, looking after things, asking for somebody, whether he's okay, whether that person has taken medicine, whether he's now well, what has happened there, what is the news. If he, always he tried to connect himself with everything and he did not waste time. This is something very important for us to understand. And uh, another thing that in relation to this, I would like to say that somehow we have not really emulated his views on education. He, had, he, he went to school, he tried to go to school, he tried to visit colleges and it was impossible for him. That dreary, that the dehumanization of education, you can say, that everything was like a classroom, desk, numbers. He wrote Tota Paki, Hemantiji and Priyadashidji, you know very well. It's so modern. This topic is about relevance. It's more than relevant. Now that the government is thinking of new education policy, they have to take notes from Ravindana Thakur about his thoughts on education. He thought that he would reintroduce the Upanishadic Gurukul system in our education, which is very important that the children must be with nature. And the learner, this is something that he said, that the learner must have freedom to learn. You see, nowadays we don't give any freedom to the learner. We just oppress him. He's, he's in a jail, really. And the create, to create an environment that enables the student to develop a kind of a healthy kinship, atmiyota, kinship with nature and cultivation of the pupil's creativity and imagination plus fun. What does the child want? He wants to play. He wants to jump about. He wants to sing. He wants to dance. If you just, if, if I, I mean, not you, I know you have done. If uh, non-Bengali listeners just read the way he took some of these classes in Vishwabharati. They are so interesting. He made them so wonderfully funny and creative. With alphabets, with numbers, he created puns, he created uh, 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 rhythms, rhymes, limericks. So the children were just enjoying themselves and having fun. At the same time, learning a lot of things without even being conscious about the fact that they were learning. This was education. This is what uh, the government of India should have pursued after 1947. That should have been the method of education throughout the country. And look what he tried to do in Vishwabharati. Look at the architecture. Look at the innovative way he was thinking to sort of create an ambience. Vishwabharati. Look at the name also. And they're like an university, a global university, which, is, which welcomes all. You know, together. We are all in it together. We are learning together. We are doing together. You know? So this, and Brahmacharya, he, the man who said that Boiraggo Shadane Mukti Shyama Noi, that this Vairagya, this monkhood, this was a typical response to Ramakrishna mission. Anyway, that is not for me. But for the same man, he realized the importance of Brahmacharya, which is something totally gone from our education. All over the world, it's exactly the opposite of Brahmacharya, our education. The teachers and the doctors, they prescribe something completely different. So Ravindana Thakur was so progressive that what he felt... This is something he, he could have just said, though, I am a poet. I've got the Nobel Prize. I, I, I can just sit on my laurels and not think about these institutions. I can just tell my, my followers, admirers to set up something like Vishwabharati. No, he did it himself. And he did not pass over this, uh, uh, this property to his own family. He entrusted the prime minister that he should be the chancellor, and which is a tradition which is still going on, you see. So he really wanted this Vishwabharati experiment to be not as just a one-off. He wanted this to be a model for the future education policy of Bharat, which was, in a way, the model from the Vedantic times. You see? So I think this is somewhere we had sort of failed him a bit. You know? And, uh, and uh, while talking about this vision, one must also read his thoughts on Panchayat. You see, we all talk about the Panchayat Raj, about Gandhi's writings on Panchayat. They are good writings, no doubt. 
but his writings are wonderful and most of the policies of the government are based on what Rabindranath Thakur had written on the panchayat system. Another false idea we have is that he was an urban person, that he did not really relate to the village. He did not really know the rural people. He knew them. If you see the stories, if you see the poems, if you see his interactions, he knew them very well. He understood them very well. In fact, while we are, we were on the topic of nationalism and he was, you were quoting all this also from Kanchunda, I remember one instance where in one of his estates, the Muslims were disturbing uh, him a lot. So he tried, he appealed to the British administration, the then British administration to do something about it. They did not. So what did he do? He called some Namashudras. He gave them money. He gave them payment and formed an army of Namashudras to stand against the Muslims. Look how practical he was. Not at all the dreamer, the romantic, the poet, you know, th thinking about uh, trees and sun and moon and, and the divinity and, sh uh, and love and all that. He was also very much grounded. So maybe it is true that his literature somehow has not yet caught on with the rural uh, population of Bengal. It is true. I, I, I live in rural areas. I find that myself. Still, the people are stuck in Kirtan, either Kirtan or mindless music. They are still not transcended to the Rabindra Sangeet level. It is still a very, in a way, an urban, semi urban uh, passion. It is true. But Rabindranath, as a, as a karma yogi, as a man who had given so much thought to panchayat institutions, a man who had given so much thought to education, to the mind of the children, this he, the, the, I also Priyadashiji, you were telling me and telling us about his Shahoj part. Such a wonderful creation, incomparable, I think, in any other language. Such a wonderful thing for all for children and their education to, to, to grow them creatively, to help them creatively to relate to the world and to enjoy their, their learning, their knowledge. So, this was my third point that I wanted to talk about, MNPG. Please unmute yourself. It was um, enchanting. It was illuminating. Um, where to start and where to end when we talk about Rabindranath? Um, he is in our veins, he is in our thoughts, um, philosophy, ideals everything. If um, Dr. Datta, if you have uh, any thoughts uh, you want to share, please go ahead. <coughs> well, let me clarify that I'm not Dr. Datta. I don't have any PhD degree. Uh, I, I just, uh, what Jaydeep Maharaj was saying about the children, you know, it is Jibon Sriti. He writes that when Tagore, he was growing up, there was hardly any book for children. And uh, uh, especially there was no way, you know, to, uh, to like uh, paintings or with lithographic. There was, there was no book like that. So I think, you know, that uh, also prompted Tagore to come up with the books for the children. And as Jodip Maharaj said, what an impact he had, had on the shaping of the Bengali language. So he also says in like in Jibon Sriti at one place that he has uh, uh, also paid attention to the language that is spoken by the servants of the house. He said even that has also evolved with time. He was, you know, so, uh, so, so conscious of that. And about the book of children, he said in our time, the book for the children were, you know, so murderously boring that hardly we used to prefer reading that. And he had one of the teacher, you know, that I think is Mr. Aghor Chandro, who was a medical student and every day he used to come and give him tuition, which he did not like. So even if it was raining, he would come and only time in a medical college, there was some brawl had taken place and that tutor had gone. Uh, uh, was injured, uh, that he did not come. The God did not want to, uh, the formal education, when he was very young, he used to, even when he was not a school student, he used to weep that, you know, other 
or his elder brothers etc were going to school so somebody who used to work in his home used to say that you know aaj jemon tumi school e jabar jonne kaancho aaj din school e na jabar jonne oi bhabe kaanbe that now that you wish to go to school but a time will come you will cry in the same manner not wanting to go to school he said that i have forgotten the name of the person even his face but i think in life nobody had said a more true a true word in this is so that is why the stegor's inspiration to come out with a alternative model of uh, idea which is uh, as uh, jodip maharaj said about the vishwa bharati and vishwa bharati now is of course a university who are teaching their science also and other things for which it was not meant vishwa bharati was meant for something else and in 1951 when vishwa bharati was being uh, transformed into a university by giving a statute Uh, many people uh, took play, uh, part in the debate and at that time uh, molana abul kalam azad was our education minister and dr shah prashad mukherjee also said it and dr shah prashad mukherjee said that uh, uh, when he was young he remembered that tagore once came to his illustrious father ashutosh mukherjee and he want to have some kind of a uh, understanding with the calcutta university if that can happen where calcutta university gives them degrees but without interfering with the autonomy of the institution so when government tried to bring this uh, 1951 bill on the vishwa bharati university at least it was very careful and all the members of the parliament that they should not uh, impinge upon the uh, not only on the working the autonomy but also the unique idea that tagore had his mind and by tr- transforming it into a modern day university it ran the risk and you see now what actually happened to vishwa bharati it has somehow unfortunately got become like like any other provincial university which often keeps in news for the wrong reasons that is another thing uh, so uh, i think that shahoj part uh, which runs into four volumes at least first three volumes i believe are entirely by tagore and the, and the paintings done by nondulal uh, uh, nondulal mm-hmm. boshu who was i think the student of his nephew avanindranath uh, it was a very good book and uh, in in all other languages of the world you can learn the alphabets from any sources any publisher writing any book but in bengali interestingly there are only three books for the last 120 years to learn bengali one is shahoj paat by rabindranath tagore hashi khushi by jogendranath sarkar and of course the uh, old one is of course uh, the borno porichoy by uh, ishwar chandra vidyashago uh, so tagore was very interested about the children and many of the tagore's uh, uh, songs are sung by the children and they also do it what is called the nitya natika they are meant for the children and with children's love so although they might have very profounder meanings but even the children could understand that uh, so that is it i think this is what i have to add uh, thank you thank you um, mr datto um without mentioning um one thing um uh, that the affinity about science learning science uh rabindranath used to be so interested in learning science and uh being a like science student for myself i always used to wonder that what rabindranath's view on science so i was doing you know a uh, few research and then uh, found out that one article got published on um, on rabindra thakur's um, science uh, interest in science published online by cambridge university uh, 2019 it uh, got published and it says that Uh, in 1925 rabindranath tagore wrote to prafullo chandra rai we know uh, about him um, the distinguished chemist scientist i was sitting reading scientific american when i noticed an envelope from the university college of science uh, where prafullo chandra taught so my thinking uh, just then um, that how many poets read scientific american as a past time one really wonders and uh, another um, 
episode that um, I found very interesting about uh, Rabindranath's conversation with um, Einstein. And uh, Einstein actually was asking Rabindranath this question, do you believe in the divine as isolated from the world? As we know, we had a, they had a very um, beautiful conversation uh, between them. And uh, it, was, uh, it is an excerpt from one of Einstein and Tagore's conversation. Um, so he actually responded, not isolated. The infin infinite personality of man comprehends the universe. There cannot be anything that cannot be subsumed by the human personality. And this proves that the truth of the universe is human truth. I have taken a scientific fact to explain this. Explain, Rabindranath is explaining how he is explaining matter is composed of protons and electrons with gaps between them. But matter may seem to be solid. Similarly, humanity is composed of individuals, yet they have their interconnection of human relationship, which gives living unity to man's world. The entire universe is linked up with us in a similar manner. It is a human universe I have pursued this thought through art, literature, and the religious consciousness of man. How wonderful. Um, we also know that Rabindranath and Jagdish Chandra Bose actually had a very cordial relationship. When um, Rabindranath was managing the Jamindari in uh, Shilai Daho in Bangladesh, um, JC Bose used to join him on the river boat and they used to exchange their thoughts through songs, poems, and scientific experiments what J.C. Bose was uh, doing that time. So that really um, is a wonder how his talent um, reaches everywhere, the divinity, also, he, he wrote a letter to physicist Shottin Bose. Any educated person must enter the arena of science, if not the core of science. And in his regard, it is no shame to take the help of literature. I am not a serious student of science, but I had this endless temptation for tasting the juice of science from my very childhood. I was then about 12 when I had gone with my revered father to the Dalhousie Hills. After the day's hard work, we would settle on a um, divian in the veranda. The sun provides a curtain of light around the earth, and therefore we are unable to visualize the universe beyond. During the day, the day ends and the sun sets the lid of light disappears and it is then innumerable stars lit up in the dark sky. And his father, Maharshi Devendranath Thakur, he used to actually explain uh, to him the, about stars, about the galaxy, about um, the darkness uh, of the sky. And he used to be bewildered, surprised with all this unknown so with that, I will um, request Mr. Datto, please um, elaborate on Swadeshi Bhavna of Rabindranath. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Harmontidi. And I think this very illuminating lecture by Joydeep Maharaj, I think little remains to be said. Uh, but I have been uh, requested to speak on the Swadeshi uh, uh, thought of Tagore. Uh, I cannot translate it to uh, patriotism or exactly anything like that, but let us keep it Swadeshi. <coughs> there is a lecture which was given by Rabindranath Tagore during the heydays of the anti-partition movement in Bengal, which 
lasted from 1905 to 1911, but Tagore was associated towards the beginning of it. So there was a lecture that he delivered at the Minava Theatre at that time. It was called the Shwadeshi Shomaj. Uh, that lecture he had to give it give again on a popular demand. And in Swadeshi Shamaj book, in the preface that he writes one thing, that this Swadeshi Shamaj is uh, somehow his lecture was prompted by scarcity of water in Bengal, which is otherwise known as a very watery and wet province. So Tagore says that in previously, that it, it is in pre-colonial India or in ancient India, water, education, uh, upkeep of the temples, the many things were actually not done by the state, but they were the responsibility of the society. But now what has happened with the growth, with the coming of the British and the growth of the new idea of state on the European model, amongst the Indians also, we want state to do everything. This is said has actually resulted in many problems. And at one place, he says there brilliantly, that line he says, that today we are subjugated, not because the British is ruling over us, but because the society has relinquished many of the responsibilities willingly to the state. The, the responsibilities which belonged to the society earlier, it has transferred to the state. And in that sense, we have become a subjugated people. We are not subjugated because the British are ruling over us. We are subjugated because we have voluntarily given up the things which belong to the realm of the society to the state. Now, what would state do? State, if you say about water supply, the state may, in a budget, give you a half lakh of rupees or something like this. But it is the society that has to do the upkeep. That, is, that, that was Tagore's idea. That the, that the wellspring of the Indian society is actually not in its political institution, but in its social institutions. Had our wellspring of life been in the political institution, Indian society and Indian civilization would also have perished like many other civilizations of the world. But because the source of the, the life of Indian society was actually in a social institutions, India could survive even without political power for long. Actually, we are, when we are speaking about the uh, Muslim period, especially Bengal, which came under Islamic rule uh, somewhere around the uh, late 12th century. So how Bengal still had survived with its own. And even if you see the in, in Bangladesh also, as you know, that whatever Tagore's views on the Muslims, uh, it is the Tagore songs, uh, Tagore song written on the Bengal. That is also the uh, national anthem of Bangladesh. So Tagore is the one person whose song, uh, who, who wrote the national anthem for at least two, uh, two, two nations. So uh, this is what Tagore says in, some, uh, in, in his uh, essay, which is called Shadesh. He says that when we see Indian history, the way Indian history is taught, it seems to be the, a history of a clash and conflict. Some people, he was meaning to the, the Greeks, the Shakas and Hunas, invaders came upon India. And if one invader goes, another comes. If one invader grows weak, there is another invader uh, to deal with. So if an outsider sees the history of India, he will only see Indian history as a long succession of invasion and the Indians fighting against it. But he says, like a person uh, who is outside uh, the house, when there is a sandstorm, when, the, when there is a storm there, or, or, or a whirlwind, that is the most important event of the day. He says it in his uh, um, essay, Swadesh. That is the most important event. But at the time when the storm is going on outside, do you think nothing is going outside inside our homes? No, the life goes on almost as usual in the home. So to the historians, historians write about Delhi and Agra, which was the capital of India, as you know, during the uh, Delhi Sultanate period and the uh, Mughal period. But he says when there was uh, Delhi and Agra, 
there was also navadweep and banaras navadweep and banaras represent the centers of indian learning so he said when we see indian history from outside we see as if it is a political history it is everything is centered around delhi and agra but that is not true there is a inner history of india which is uh, which revolves around the places like banaras and navadweep if when there was delhi and agra there was navadweep and uh, banaras also so ravindranath tagore's view of india is a perennial india it is a timeless india it is a everlasting india that is the wellspring of tagore's uh, view of india if you see in tagore's writing i think the more bengali people will be, be able to appreciate it in bengal you have the names of girls ujjaini now ujjaini is actually ujjain it is in madhya pradesh but you don't find in north india the names the girl ujjaini you have the name bipasha which comes from punjab the uh, women in uh, uh, girls in bengal have the name bipasha you also find the name prasanjit and udayan who are actually the kings of koshal and avantika in ancient india this is tagore in his writings wrote so much about he tried to revive this idea of the ancient india of course he was not a historian he did not write it with the dates and uh, you know uh, one article which i once read in desh that tagore was uh, very unparticular about the date he would mix up even in his own life he did not remember once that how long ago years ago his daughter was married without 20 years or was it 10 years he cannot recall that but tagore's idea of indian history was an inner indian history that is why you find the tagore many of the tagore's poems are on gautam buddha and many of the poems that you were uh, jadip maharaj was also referring to and hoymontidi was also referring to that about the shivaji utsav but even earlier shivaji utsav was written around 1906 i i think when shivaji utsav was actually celebrated in calcutta on the behest of um, uh, <coughs> when tilak and kapade also came there <coughs> and shakaram ganesh deuskar was there so he wrote shivaji utsav but even in the late 19th century yes. many of the poems that he wrote which are in which are in katha in this book called katha o kahini <coughs> there are poems on gautam buddha there are poems on shivaji there are poems of the sikh guru like guru gobind singh there is uh, um, uh, and there there are others like uh, uh, any any other uh, some of the uh, hindu hero or the episodes the lesser known episodes so this was tagore's view was seeing india in its entirety and in the perennial cultural uh, um, discovery for him on gautam buddha tagore was one of the person of course gautam buddha was completely forgotten in india i'm very few people know about that he was discovered during the archaeological philological and the numismatic discoveries which came actually happened with the early british orientalist and then came many indian historians also who wrote about the period of gautam buddha in early 20th century but tagore in the 19th century wrote so much about buddha but his writing about buddha was not given on the buddha's history but you know buddha's own outlook and some of the poems like the nagor lokhi and others uh he used to idolize buddha but when he first went to sri lanka he found that he he uh, he the he actually criticizes the parochialism in the name of the buddhism that he finds in sri lanka and at the other places it was when he was in sri lanka once he had gone to sri lanka four times uh once for the his play shap mochon in the 1922 i have come across a poem which is writ written by robert rossayya thambi who later on who was who was of course a christian tamil who later on became solicitor general in ceylon so he as a young person was present at jaffna when tagore came there and that poem which i have i do not recom uh, i don't completely remember it but he said full well do i remember those palm uh, uh, those days when you came to our palm fringed isle so he says in the last line that you are the rishi of course that robert rossayya thambi could not understand bengali but even then he was the one of the persons to say tagore was a rishi 
and this is again maybe the power of translation which we are saying so uh, what i wish to say that tagore's understanding of uh, hindu civilization was based on very culture in 1927 when he went uh, for a tour of uh, the uh, subarna bhumi of the southwest asia southwest asia uh, uh, southeast asia actually the malaya singapore and the other places bali borneo java etc he was accompanied by some others most well known amongst them <coughs> was i think suniti kumar chattopadhyay who later on wrote a book called deepmoy bharat and tagore also wrote on that journey a book called java jatrir patra if you see the deepmoy bharat it is much more factual giving facts etc tagore says that he is not bothered so much about the facts Tagore was bothered actually about the insight, about the feeling, and how Hindu civilization was alive in Southeast Asia despite a major part of being converted in Indonesia to Islam. That he writes very well, and he writes about the temples, about the Ramayana, and how it is the Ramayana paintings that are there in houses, even of the Muslims. He he writes that that how the Ramayana is played there. He writes that. so this was in 1927 and he writes there that when the i mean he was referring to a historical incident that when uh, indian ocean came under the islamic uh, the, 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 the the arabic dominance hindus stopped going to the sea in the ancient time there our hindu forefathers had gone to southeast asia and set up their temples including the world's biggest temple angkor wat and tagore says that in between india forgot southeast asia the hindu gave up seafaring and now with the change of the time seafaring has again begun so one of his poem that was originally called bali but later on the name was changed to shagorika is actually a poem which is says that a lover from india has come to his beloved which is the personified uh southeast asia and has come from india and uh, uh says that once he if i may remember that poem i don't completely remember that poem that he comes there as if to a beloved and uh, he says that uh, not as a king and not as a, i came as a very simple person and southeast asia actually uh, um, uh, southeast asia welcomes him even tagore himself was uh, welcome there there <coughs> so tagore's understanding of indian culture was completely of a perennial india as i refer to uh, some of the things of course later on tagore's family as you know was associated with the hindu mela hindu mela was actually an attempt to take the uh, to, uh, to take the uh, political uh, the the the, the, uh, the consciousness from the cities to the suburban areas and to the villages it started somewhere in 1867 if i'm not wrong <laughs> by nabogopal mitro and the real brain behind it writing was actually Uh, Sri Aurobindo's uh, grandfather, maternal grandfather, Rajnarayan Bosch. Actually, Rajnarayan Bosch and Tagore's father, Maharshi Devendra Tagore, had a very interesting connection. When Tagore's father started a magazine, uh, which um, um, uh, at, uh, 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 in in the eighteen forties, uh, i'm i'm not able to it's a very interesting name but i'm not able to just recall it now no no so the first uh, uh, translation of rigveda was started by rajnarayan bosch so uh, 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 and uh, uh, maharshi devendranath gave him that space and later on you know maharshi devendranath's son rabindranath tagore and shri aurobindo had also a very interesting connection in 1907 rabindranath tagore writes on shri aurobindo aurobindo rabindrer lohon namaskar he bondhu desho bondhu bharat attar bani murti tumi it is in 1907 i think this is just before uh, he got 
आई वाज जस्ट रेफरिंग टू दैट नेम ऑफ दैट मैगजीन इट वाज तत्त्वबोधिनी पत्रिका दो तत्त्वबोधिनी सभा वाज मर्ज्ड विद ब्राह्मो समाज बट दैट मैगजीन लिव्ड ऑन ऑलमोस्ट फॉर 90 इयर्स आई एम टोल्ड सो हिज अरविंदोस ग्रैंडफादर एंड टेगोर्स फादर हैड आल्सो हैड एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू वर्क टुगेदर इन द 1840स फॉर द सम टाइम and then on rajnarayan bose went and he settled down in deoghar and rajnarayan bose was actually called the grandfather of the of, of nationalism and many including vivekananda shakaram deustar and all others you know many were influenced by him so uh, uh, tagore uh, when aurobindo became a national figure and later on he got embroiled in the alipur bomb case but later on when aurobindo went to pondicherry somewhere around 1928 tagore also went to meet there and uh, by the ship and then they came through the ship by by the sea route they came to pondicherry from uh, from um, calcutta and uh, tagore also met aurobindo there and he said some 20 years ago i had said aurobindo robindre loho namaskar i had at that time i had seen him uh, he, him as, as a rising star In, in in the nationalistic field now i see him as a sage so now again i say to him aurobindo robindre loho namaskar <coughs> and uh, this was the uh, tagore's view uh, on this but uh, many of the people are a bit confused on rabindranath tagore's view on the uh, with the british uh those who say that tagore was actually soft on the british i would like to read them some uh, some of the uh, essays which are contained in a book called raja proja and one of the uh, essays there called kontharod or suppression of voice which actually written by tagore or, i mean it was a delivered as a speech by tagore in bengali and tagore's writing was very humorous sometimes it could be very sarcastic and he says that tagore says that if the bengali newspaper sorry the vernacular newspaper why bring this uh, uh, the, this draconic clauses against them actually these newspapers through which these newspapers british can actually know what is going on in the indian mind if you suppress them you lose away completely there is that story that before the 1857 revolt there were this chapatis that were i do not know whether there is a story about that this was uh, <coughs> rotated from one um, cantonment to the other cantonment it was said to be it is actually a message for the revolution he said not a single word was written on that chapati but yet that led to a great uh, conflagration the snake bite is actually dangerous because a snake comes in secret and it bites you in complete silence so he said if british want that that after having taken us to this position when there is a media when there is a press they again want to suppress actually it would be actually goes against the safety of the british empire itself and another thing he says um, about in that raja proja which is says that the british had a you know he called it doipayan sanskriti the island it i mean doipayan also means something very different in india it refers to krishna doipayan but uh, the islanded mindset the islanded mindset which is says he says that the british would like to do material and moral improvement of india but they would not come in close contact with us i mean british would prefer to because in those days very few indians used to wear shoes when going outside unless today but a british would always wear shoe even if one is going to bed that means wherever even uh, subtle and soft sensibilities are required that the british would not care about that the british is more careful that there is no threat to his um, uh, threat to his empire and for that reason what he is doing he has put on his own boot and there is an entire field and if field sometimes you know the birds come so the british actually want to uh, uh, shoo away the birds but in that process he is running over the entire field uh, uh um, completely overlooking the fact that it is not the bird which is eating more of the grains but it is actually the boots which is completely uh, <coughs> crushing the grains so british 
culture is like this that in india they would try to give bring laws they would try to bring uh, things for the moral and material improvement of india but they would not come into close contact with the indians to know about what is there in the heart of the indians this same thing we find in his 1916 lecture which is called the nationalism that he gave in america that nationalism lecture uh was very you can say it was very subtle and it uh, for some people it could be very controversial also but in that tagore says that the indian concept of nationhood is very different from the european concept of nationhood the european concept of nationhood is organization of all the military and commercial strength to achieve a materialistic purpose the indian sense of nationhood is not like this although in a modern period indians were trying to come up with that kind of good so he said that the british uh, establishment in india is completely impersonal it is impassive it has no sensibility and he gives the example that sometimes and views the very humorous his writings has you know very uh, large dollops of humor and he says that in the newspapers nowadays you can find across advertisements which say that certain biscuit makers produce biscuits which are completely untouched by hand i mean they are so hygienic i mean in india you can still give people through hand but in the western countries it is completely forbidden people have to wear a gloves or something like this i mean even human touch is sometimes says that dangerous it can lead to some kind of infection so they would always sometimes wear gloves or like this so tagore says that the british contact with india is completely like this completely uncontaminated or untouched by the hands i mean there is nothing human it is like a big machine the the, the british empire is like a machine there is no human sense in that and that is what actually struck tagore the most that and <coughs> in another is uh, the i think the i think it is called the poshim jatri diary in which tagore very interesting when tagore wrote that his age was almost similar at the time of when uh, swami vivekananda went and delivered the lecture in chicago it almost came about that 1891 or 1893 i don't remember so therein at one place uh, tagore says uh, even at that time many indians had this view that the british can be overthrown but tagore says we don't realize that how powerful the british are but he says there another interesting thing that Uh, which is which very interesting in the hindsight that all of us felt that the freedom movement is actually about expelling the british from india but he said i mean what will you do to the new idea uh, to the new uh, ways and the means with which the british is given to the indians that the indian the, the whole society's grammar has changed he interestingly says there now college padho office e kaaj karo hotel e khao so tagore had this subtlety to understand that even if british goes away from india the state will continue like this i mean the ancient state that coming after the british had become redundant i mean when we got independence from the british we had a parliament we passed the laws we have a bureaucracy that is uh, a political and Uh, completely non-military bureaucracy. All these are of a successor state of Britain. So this India, which got independence from the British in the 1947, was not the same India that has gone under the British. For some reason, there was, I think, some things also Indian gained from that. Like we have a united military command. Previously, whenever an invader came from outside, there were small kingdoms. No battle would last more than a day. now we have got so much of resources that we have a unified command that india is much more safe and secure than it was in the uh, pre british times but he says but tagore realizes this that what will you do with this new form of state that the grammar of the life has completely changed i think this is a person with tagore subtlety can understand that this is one of the reason that forms a very barrier about tagore like uh, now we have got uh, few uh, only a few days ago i mean uh, some 20 years ago somebody has said how would have tagore referred to the coming of the internet internet actually freed us from many of the boundaries and probably tagore would have liked this 
that you know all the boundaries he hated the many of the boundaries tagore did not like so uh, internet tagore would have welcomed internet so uh, another thing is that uh, i was trying to think how tagore would have responded uh, how uh, or how tagore would have celebrated or how they responded to india's success of chandrayaan probably yes now we are in the global elite global cup we have landed in the moon though you are not set in human beings but we have landed in the moon that is uh, for a very privileged few india has broken into that club but now again what we are feeling probably that uh, 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 from tagore's point of view it would be that after all we have gone to the moon it is very good achievement but it is still a material achievement Tagore's view in the is in the song that Akash bhara shur jo tara, Vishwa bhara pran, Tahari maj khane ami peche moz khan, Vishwa yatai jage amar gaan. That Tagore says that kind of an amazement that there is the sky or the space is full of stars, sun and the moons, and in that and the world and the space is full of the vital energy the pran and in that i have got my place as a human being in this vast cosmos that actually gives me a thrill uh, that actually excites me that thrill so everything about tagore's this amazement so tagore's way of the if you uh, shanti niketan which unfortunately i have not gone there is a uh, there is a, a, a quote from the taittiriya upanishad which says akash shariram brahma prana ramam mananandam like this so in our upanishads we have this akash shariram brahma the, the sky body divine which is actually the our inner space so tagore would have been actually more interested in this inner space and tagore's upanishads tagore had a deep interest in the upanishads and that is quoted uh, there also this idea of tagore's universe is not the universe that is merely outside but what interacts in this one of his hibbert lectures that is the religion of man tagore also says that the organisms that monstrously develop the size of their beings i think he was i do not know i was uh, at that time i was i mean he did not say about dinosaurs especially they got extinct from the world but human beings if you compare him is much inferior in many of the physical strength or physical size to many of the animals but not only human being has survived why because human beings did not consider their growth only in the physical plane we considered that there is an atom from that atom a cell is made then the cells combine human beings development of the human being cannot be solely be measured on the achievements of the material plane this is again you know uh, uh, this is the view of tagore so this amazement i find you know nowadays uh, we may measure tagore only by whether he was a nationalist or he was an internationalist so <laughs> i would call tagore is still the person through which india is known at many places abroad you have the tagore centers you have many people who do not know bengali most of the those people in the world though but they have tried to know india through tagore he was in touch with roma rola and many others um, uh, indologist many others came here like rottenstein who were actually uh, people came from Uh, china uh, by knowing this by, attracted by tagore they, in many of the countries that tagore went I, as i said refer to about the persia tagore went to various countries neither tagore knew their language not ever tagore you know our prime minister uh, modi ji went to greece recently tagore had gone to greece some uh, many years ago and a few years ago there is a indo hellenic society uh, uh, which is there in athens they brought out a book in 1912 to mark i think 75 years or 80 years of tagore visiting greece for a single day so many people who know about people 
uh, many of the days we know uh, India through Gandhi, but Tagore's is the another way through which India is known. Even if you go to far off Argentina, uh, many of the places in uh, like Spain in the Hispanic world, Tagore is known there. Uh, in, in, in the Hispanic world, both in Spain and in the South uh, America, Tagore is known there. In the, the Japan and also in China, with China, we have now got so many of the problems. But I think in the last to last book fair, when I had gone there just before the pandemic came, China had set up a, a pavilion in the World Book Fair in Delhi, where there were no books, but it was only dedicated to relationship of India and China, mostly based on Tagore. At that time also Doklam, etc. were going on. No doubt about that. But it is interestingly, people in the world know India through Tagore. Oh, you have come from the land of Tagore. So that is the most uh, interesting thing. And uh, I think uh, uh, Tagore, I would just finally take a few more minutes as I have taken a long time. When Tagore was born in the year 1861, that is also the year two great Indian leaders were born. One is Madan Mohan Malviya and another is Motilal Nehru. That was also the year the uh, Indian Council Act 19, 1861 was passed, which gave access to the Indian to the council, not mandatorily, but it was still the Indians uh, could now be admitted, which was previously uh, by the Chartered Acts of till 1853. It was not there. <coughs> Tagore had attended many of the Congress sessions. Uh, he had sung songs there, uh, Bande Mataram, of course, but there was a song like Oi Bhubo Namo Namo Mini and uh, Janagana Mano. I, I would just uh, uh, expatiate on Janagana Mano also because there is a controversy. But you see, Tagore was never, Tagore knew personally many of the leaders who are in, uh, who are in the independence movement. Like Tagore knew Gandhi, Tagore knew well uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawaharlal Nehru, and uh, many others uh, came there. Acharya Kriplani also, I believe, there were others uh, who came to Tagore. But Tagore never had this idea that emancipation of India could take place through politics. So he did not, according to my knowledge, he was not very interested in the Congress. Although he had attended some of the Congress sessions, his family at one time donated money to the Congress. But Tagore knew that the India's path is not primarily a political path. What we speak today of nationalism or um, uh, universalism, we see it through the uh, political prism. That was not with Tagore. And uh, Tagore also, uh, Subhash Chandra Bosch, I could uh, speak a few words about this very interesting relationship. As you know, when Subhash Chandra Bosch uh, founded the Mohajati Shadon in Calcutta, uh, Mohajati Shadon was, you know, built later on because Subhash Chandra Bosch had to leave in 1941. But there was actually a Silanya, so the stone laying, cornerstone laying ceremony had been done. And it was a there is a there is a video also available of that moment when Tagore came. It may be available on the internet also. So he called uh, Tagore for to lay this uh, Tagore to lay this uh, cornerstone. And Tagore also wrote when Subhash Chandra Bose was uh, expelled almost from the Congress after the Tripuri Congress. So he said he had written a very uh, letter, uh, you know, idolizing. To, um, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, and which he was the first to call Subhash Chandra the Deshonayok, the captain of the nation. Ami tomake Deshonayoker pode boron korila. He called Subhash Chandra Bose Deshonayok. So Tagore on certain things has not been actually afraid. He supported Subhash Chandra Bose. He said that not because I am a Bengali, not because Subhash Chandra Bose belongs to Bengal and he has been aggrieved and he has been the injustice. But I say, as I say as an Indian, that what has happened to Subhash is wrong. Another thing, uh, when um, uh, he went to Japan, you know, there is an interesting story of when Rashbihari Bose in 1915 fled India. Uh, there was uh, what is called Red Corner Notice against him and that there was a uh, uh, warrant against him. And he ran away under the name of P.N. Tagore 
ostensibly a family member of the tagore or or a relative of the tagore he said that rabindranath tagore is going to japan in a few days and i have been i am going there to find out about his accommodation and okay he was allowed at that time there was not much of passport etc was necessary so he uh, in a ship he went away to uh, japan and then after the british realized that actually those who want to, whom they wanted to arrest has completely fled uh, actually this idea then came to british that rabindranath tagore is going there as a royal guest of the japanese king so why do they he would need somebody to go there and find out about his accommodation but when rabindranath tagore went there uh, there is a he visited the uh, the uh, rashbihari bose's family there is a picture there is a photograph which may be available on the internet about his family and rashbihari bose also Uh, uh, also translated uh, Sheshar Kobita, the last novel that Jodi Pawaraj referred to, in the in in Japanese. So that is also another uh, very interesting thing about uh, Tagore, and uh, Tagore, uh, especially in the uh, what you call the anti-Bengal partition movement, some of the Tagore's very interesting poems were written about that time and. Like Amolo Dhabolo Palete Lege Che Mondo Moduro Hawa Deki Nai Kobu Deki Nai Amono Taroni Bawa Ha Tor Mora Gange Baane Che Che Bhasha Tori Joy Ma Bole All these are said to be actually seen the life that was in in full flow in the nineteen in the nineteen oh five that is a, a new turn it came into the life of the Bengal and Tagore was the first person who did a Rakhi Bandhon Utshab. i mean uh, raksha bandhan is coming but this raksha bandhan is more cultural religious raksha bandhan tagore that is did was against the partition of bengal it was sometime in november i do not exactly remember the date in 1905 october october yeah. october, october, october 60 october that is that it 1905 and that interestingly is written in a very by gorowa by rani chando and um, um, abhinandanath tagore was there but then he realized you know his family has uh, put up some money to uh, to have a ship that used to uh, um, commute people from this shore of ganga to the other shore all free of cost it was called the shodeshi steamer and later on uh, it failed because there was no monetary idea behind idea behind this but tagore also got i think dissolution by some of the so called leaders of the anti bengal partition movement <coughs> whose shadow you can find in his uh, novel ghore baire the home and the world that the people who appear to be outside leaders and great patriots from outside what is actually their inner life so stegor said that so tegor made a uh, tegor actually uh, created a distance with him and with the other leaders uh and that he came opted out of politics as far as i know then and uh, uh tagore also at one point of time some say dissociated himself with all this later 19th century writing about his nationalism there is what you call the aggressive nationalism when he speaks of banda bahadur of uh, uh, of the last sikh guru guru gobind singh of shivaji etc but even in 1906 shivaji has written uh the um, uh, shivaji has written uh, the that shivaji utsav which is a very uh, which is uh, in in uh, views of some a more mature work than even his uh, work bharat tirtho uh, some feel like that and finally i come to that there is a controversy regarding tagore's uh, 1911 song uh, janagano mano whose uh, five stanza poem but whose uh, first stanza is only used as our the national anthem now if you find there there is in his his, his uh, uh, book of songs which is called gitobitan there is a particular section called shodesh porja as there is jodip maharaj said prem and puja there is shodesh then there is some other also so in that shodesh porja many of the songs are there so this uh, um, um, janagano mano is also there in the shodesh porjai and it is actually a mistaken belief that tagore wrote it in favor of uh, uh, um, george v if you go by the contemporaneous record the most important of it the record of the 1911 congress session in calcutta it says nothing like that it says there was some young small girls who wrote up song 
uh, in well, uh, praise of the king in hindi but tagore song was never uh, say in uh, was seen as in praise of george fifth i think where from this confusion stem was the anglo indian press most of his journalists has left the scene uh, from that time and they just wrote it on a hearsay and this uh, uh, this actually controversy dog tagore during his own lifetime and tagore says no the dispenser of india's destiny that jono bharat to bhagya vidhata he cannot be george fifth or george sixth it is never like that it is actually the destiny the, the 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 dispenser of destiny it is all, actually the almighty probably that tagore was referring to as bharat to bhagya vidhata poton obhudaye bondhura pontha jugo jugo dhabito jatri so india marches on through many of the hurdles and the ups and the downs and uh, uh, of 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 history visitors of history so that is one thing this 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 was quite settled at that time no indian newspaper uh, identified tagore song in praise of uh, george v and this is actually a post facto debate that rose of course it happened during the life of tagore and tagore was tired of clarifying it and if you see the other poems of sodesh porjay amar desher mati tomar pore chhuai mata interestingly we say that tagore saw bharat bongo tagore three level something says the bongo mata mata and he also says the bharat mata and he said bishwa mata world is also our mother as we say it is in the atharva veda it's where so tagore is like that rishi he sees things in the perspective he sees that indian india as a part of the whole of humanity tumate bishwa mayer achol pata how i love india because i see the entire world in you and if you see in that uh, 1938 tripuri lecture of uh, but, uh, of uh, uh, subhash chandra bosu subhash chandra bosu says in the last that india could set to be a mini world and solution to the problems of india would bring to the solution of the problem of the world it is india freed uh, india freed is world saved so that probably give you know some idea into tagore how tagore viewed the nationalism and entire of the tagore's life was passed in the colonial era in which the indians did not uh, have much say in the affairs of the state even if they have gone, gone into assembly but tagore had this distrust of the councils tagore said this distrust of the newspapers and it is one of his writings in that collection of essays which is called shodesh he he is uh, envisage a person called gurudev he tagore says himself gurudev he says that our gurudev will be the person who would lead india he does not want to give lectures in the council he does not want to get adoration from the english newspapers he does not want to get the clappings in the uh, from the this uh, public uh, uh, the, the, this public meetings whom we call gurudev or the person who will save india will actually have to work from uh, uh, f- f- from his s- center of the meditation and that is what uh, jodip maharaj also says that he is tagore belong to you know tagore was born like he was a person from calcutta but his father had actually set up shantiniketan it was left to tagore to actually to enlarge the shantiniketan and give it a new meaning as an ashram not only as an ashram but as a center of education there is a center of art so it is like this that tagore was born it is like uh, uh, you know that uh, parashuram who was called he killed his mother but for a purpose he said again uh, uh, bring my mother to life tagore was born in the gangetic plains the very lush green uh, he was in the joda shako their family but tagore went away to a village in the rad bengal which is a arid part of bengal because of course they had some connections there for for a long time but it was tagore's area of sadhana was set up there and that is the most interesting part of tagore he might have gone across the world but tagore's karma bhumi was in the birbhum in shantiniketan
and this shantiniketan took up on a very expanded meaning due to the work of the due to work of tagore shantiniketan was just simply grand father was just simply maybe an ashram in tagore it became a center of education then the entire place almost took up the name of shantiniketan even the municipality i think i have not gone there it is like this so that is you know tagore what you call uh, jadip maharaj was saying he was a karma yogi people should learn from him actually that even at this advanced stage tagore how he kept at the initial days when he was younger he used to do wrestling also and tagore had a, used to always keep his body very fit and he used to take a glass of neem juice every day and uh, there, there are some interesting anecdotes about that once a person came to him and he saw that uh, tagore taking a juice and he did not know it is of neem he thought it must be made up some uh, uh, sweet and pishta badam etc and he started salivating so tagore said would you like to have a glass of uh, this kind of a sherbat a uh, person said okay not bad uh, so he said to his <laughs> smiling tagore said to his uh, personal help that to to bring him this to bring this is told the servant to bring him exactly this kind of uh, um, of a sherbat but when the person took it he actually put it out so tagore laughed very much and he said bring him another gla glass of with sweetened with badam and pishta give him another glass of uh, so so it was it, it was like this you know so tagore was a kind of a rishi and this quality of detachment that is a very important part of it whenever you see that tagore tagore one part of tagore is involved but other part of the tagore is already detached and that is why he is called a rishi and he had the other ideas which we cannot speak because time is oh because tagore did so many things for the uh, development of the countryside and all other things you know uh, this is tagore he was not just only a creative person he was a constructive person and in the last i would say that if you say that tagore's we want independence tagore's if you say independence at swadhinata at swadhinata or swatantrata in hindi it was not tagore's path was the path of mukti tagore like this word you know i think once somebody came and asked to give a name of a film tagore gave the name mukti in mukti tagore's word that is that that is the india's way is mukti the emancipation or what if you say that liberation that was the tagore's path that india may be politically free but whether india stick to its own goal its own originality and that is what the panchayat system that jagdish uh, jagdish was that the panchayat was saying that that panchayat that tagore says tagore was not so enamored with parliament he had gone to british parliament also when he was very young he had seen lectures there in house of commons but tagore was not enamored with it so uh, anyway so tagore i think uh, we have to end and uh, uh, so i like it Uh, i hope uh, i have been able to give something of tagore's view so i think that is it thank you so much priyadar sidhi it was it was such an insightful uh, discussion and um, your your view on tagore on so many things um it was definitely amazing and um all our viewers particularly non bengali viewers they had an extensive idea um and uh idea about this great person and his work his creativity his involvement in the national uh, revolution um in india during 19th century and afterwards and also modern related to modern uh, modern revolution in india so i definitely think like we need to have couple of more sessions when we talk about rabindranath um talking about rabindranath and um in one session it's not sufficient mm -hmm. so we got a couple of questions here and a lot of comments i can see so the question i want you to address um i'll ask uh, maharaj uh to address how does rabindranath view of cosmopolitanism in sync with vasudhai va kutumbakam i think can i just I you think, can just say it in I like you know he way. has a uh, very very wonderfully elucidated on that topic about uh, his idea of humanity 
and his idea of uh, his country, his con 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 completely different idea about uh, nationalism, self-governance, and uh, mukti from a personal point of view, and also from a civilizational point of view. I think he has made it very clear, and we had a had a three-hour conversation already. I think, I think we yes, do not I think yes, yeah, no, yeah, I also. Uh, but I would just like, as a as a just sort of ending note about this controversy regarding the national anthem, I would just give my personal feeling about it. Look, we have grown up singing the national anthem. We have grown up looking at the Indian flag and doing namaskar and bowing our head to our country. We have not thought about George V when we were singing the national yes. anthem. You see? So the so the anthem now, Janagana Mana, does not belong to Ravindra Thakur anymore. It belongs to us. Yes. Awesome. belongs to us and our relationship with our country. So I think that is enough. I do not really, I do, we do not need to hassle over these, uh, bicker over these things anymore yes, after yes. all these years. Yes, Ayvindiji, you can sign off if you want to. One more question yes. came like, what is the um, connection between Rabindranath and Vivekananda? Uh, pronouns... Um, just a question, could you discuss about two trends of Swamiji and Ravi Thakur? Uh, very yes, briefly, if you... This calls for another episode, actually. Another yeah, episode, exactly. actually. <laughs> <laughs> this calls for the, another, another two-hour episode. <laughs> so... I think we yes, should end. I think it's 11 o'clock. we should yeah, end now. Yes, actually, yes. we are going to have a session um, on Vivekananda. Yes. So we can uh, address this question in there. Yes. Um, that brings um, me to the last concluding session. And there I want to... Um, just... I want to conclude with a, uh, with a poem uh, that I wrote on his birthday and uh, that poem is in Bengali and I want to uh, share in Bengali. Shabhi to bole gacho kobi jibone rantorale korecho dhikkhar abar prosong shao. Ujjubi to kore malobi kata unmochon kore mukti ruchash prokritu shikhar bole. E shikha puthi gato nahe. Nahe ekono degree. ये जानो अंतु शोलीला चेतुना शक्ति तो वो जीवन क्या नो हरिये जाए अनाकांक्षी तो और चेतुना तार गाव हरे गाव हरे तुम्हारो तो दुखु चिलो को भी बुक चापा कान्ना तो वो कॉलम तो धोरे चिले छोड़िए चिले हीरे पान्ना जीवने लागाम टा धोरे चिले जानो कुरुक्षेत्रेर कृष्णो शामो दुखों पान करें चिले हे जितेंद्रियों प्रोग्गा तुमी हे बंधु हे बीर बांगलीरे करो आरेक टी बार उन्नतों शीर। In today's context, Bengal, uh, when we look at Bengal, it pains us. So after this, all this discussion, after uh, Rabindranath's vision he was a visionary so bengal needs to do a lot of things to come up on the front line and with that i conclude this session thank you so much to maharaj and priyadarshi ji and akshay ji for hosting sangam i really like to thank from bottom of my heart sangam talks for hosting this program. All the viewers out there uh, sitting patiently, listening to us, listening to these esteemed uh, scholars and speakers, I definitely, definitely extend my thanks to them and appreciate their being with us. Namaskar. We also thank you. Over, over and Akshay Ji. Thank you, esteemed panelists, for joining. Uh, this was a great session. I am sure our audience would have uh, enjoyed it a lot. Indeed, Rabindranath Thakurji was a very multifaceted personality. And we could have talked even more about it. But uh, time has run out now. So thank you so much for joining.
थैंक यू बांग्ला आभार थैंक यू प्रियदर्शनी जी थैंक यू जयदीप महाराज नमस्कार आई विल एंड दिस सेशन थैंक यू